everyone and welcome to another episode of the Broken by Concept podcast. We've got Nathan Mott, we've got Coach Curtis speaking about myself in the third person, off to a good start. Um, today, I want to do a bit of a, start with a bit of an update on the live coaching yep, front. Big, big episode last week. Yep. If you haven't watched that, probably a good idea to watch that. Right. Just so to TLDR, TLDR, in case right. of the people who haven't seen the past episode, basically Nathan started this whole live coaching thing on his Twitch that he's shamelessly plugged every episode. There'll be another one, twitch.tv <laughs> slash Nathan Mott. And um, essentially, you know, I said, I'll give it a crack as well, just to see what it looks like for mid, because you were doing it through the jungle roll. Jungle was very different to mid. One of the big things we said were the amount of lull states and how you can communicate with the client live coaching versus mid. And we explored I, the pros and cons of live coaching, the things that we I've, I've found, experimented with, right. what works, what's not been working. So if you want to check that out, look at the last episode. Um, but essentially, yeah, I gave it a crack. I, I did it twice. I did two live live coaching streams. What's your findings, Curtis? What okay. You, what's some learnings? Yeah, so we'll start with... I, like I said, stayed true to myself what I said last episode. I said I was just going to dive in. No preparation, never done it before, no format, nothing. And I'll be honest, I think the first the first stream was an absolute disaster. It was I, I was lost. I didn't even know what to say. I didn't know when to say things. I felt like I was making the player play worse at every turn. Um, I didn't really know when to stop reviewing the game. I think in hindsight, going in blind was not a good idea. I basically... There needs to be some sort of loose structure around it. I think that was really, I think, very important. Like you have in yours, you have your your strikes, your end of review moments, you have like key messages that you get across. You kind of have like a format. And I think that format or even a loose format is very, very crucial to even beginning to learn, right? It's kind of like bringing it back to league. Like you need something that you, you're actively testing yeah, because if you're structure, testing nothing, yeah. then you're just going to be lost. Mm. So I think that's kind of my main learning from day one. So I think that was a... A comp basically a complete waste yeah. of time. So or went into the day with no structure thing and you just felt I lost everything. It was just, it was just a mess. Didn't, I, 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 didn't, I didn't everywhere. know what I was there to do. Nothing made sense. And I, I honestly came away from it just feeling very humbled and be like, okay, this is... Whatever I just did then was not it. And I need to try something different. So I, I, I you know, people gave me some feedback and I did some reflecting and I, and I came with a, a round two. With a vengeance, I had a bit of a plan this time. So my plan anyway, in theory was to kind of only speak in terms of keywords in the lane phase to kind of maybe usher or point the, the person in the right direction without overwhelming their mental state. Because one of the things I found the first time around is that when I would say things while they were laning, it would, it would either make them tunnel vision on something such that they would miss another piece of information or I would just straight up overwhelm their mental stack. They would get distracted and then they would just make a basic mistake. So I just didn't feel like it was effective to me to actually just talk while they're in the lane at all. I think I spoke too much. So I tapered it off massively and spoke in kind of keywords and, and really was hands off because ultimately I can't change the way a person is trading without really severely hamstringing them in terms of just like other areas of their play. So I was a lot more hands-off. What are some examples of keywords? So we had things like threat check, like, you know, really who, who can kill you? That means essentially who can kill you. Teammates, like where are your teammates? Where's your jungler? Where's your team? Uh, wave, like what's happening with your wave? You need to, it's like, you need to probably think about what's happening with your wave. Reset, okay, you probably need to start thinking about when you're gonna get a recall. Basically, you know, getting them to think about that. Now. I didn't get to try all of them. I tried a few of them. Um, you know, I think it was kind of okay, I guess. But I, but my plan was to really do the bulk of my talking in the major lull states. Trying to talk about win conditions, your assessment, about your role in the comp, that sort of thing, right? Anyway, so I had a crack. I did it. It, it, it definitely felt better than the first time around. I will say, though, um, these are kind of my observations. Number one... You know, I think me speaking less definitely allowed the client to play to their true level. Like, I think they were less nervous and they were just able to just play at their level a lot more. But that came at a downside. The downside being that I'm not really saying anything for the majority of the lane phase. And from a viewer experience and even from their experience, I'm not really able to give a lot of value. It almost felt like I was walking on glass. <laughs> like, oh, do I do I say something? If I do, is that, is that going to ruin their journey? Or is that going to, you know, do I, I don't want, I don't want to distract them. You know, and it almost felt like every at every turn I was 
incredibly nervous that I would say something that was wrong. And I think, you know, I, it, and then the show ended up being more for the viewers than the actual person. Mm, I like this. And I, yeah. and, I, and I also found that I had to review the game. Like you don't review. No. I, I feel like I have to because I'm not speaking as much as you. So essentially if I don't review, I'm basically doing nothing. Nothing. Ah, I so I have to sense. then make, so this, it's like, for the um for the viewers, it was almost like okay, I have to review what the key learnings from this specific vod was from you know vod was because if I don't, it's like well, you kind of said a few things, they just lost the game and then go next. It, do- it like, doesn't well, make yeah, sense. What's yeah. the point? What's the point of Curtis being? What's the here? point of being even being here, yeah. right? So I think that's kind of one of the challenges I I, I was facing. Um, it's interesting you say that it's more about you felt like it was more about the viewer that's actually where my frame of mind is actually starting to evolve to. I'm going sort of down this different route. So I used to be like about, you know, how can I give value to the person that's on stream? But now I'm actually moving forward, sort of thinking about, this is more of like a, you know, you know, the, we talked about the episode about the median is the message. I'm sort of trying to fit Twitch in to how I can make it entertainment and like coaching in a way. And sort of the way that I've sort of been visualizing is that you've got the gladiator arena, the Coliseum, You've got the Twitch chat saying end of review strike and all that sort of stuff. And like, they're thinking about like the potential mm. mistakes and like saying, oh, Nathan, you should do this, this, this. And just getting the Twitch chat to think about their decision-making, you know, it's like, okay, what happens if I was in Nathan's shoes, you know, teaching that. So I'm actually, I feel like by my frame was actually, how can I actually get the Twitch chat to coach the person that he's not really directly coaching, but they're thinking about the decisions that I'm making. So I'm sort of moving away from like, it's about the person on stream. It's actually about the Twitch chat. Yeah, the no, people totally. are watching. That's actually where my frame of mind is currently. So I'm actually going down this, this rabbit hole in the next couple of weeks. It's almost as if the client getting coached is kind of the sacrificial. Yeah, the one sacrificial for the greater born. good for everyone else to get the learning, yes. which is a little bit weird. It's very it? weird, isn't it's, it? That's a weird dynamic. It's, it's not because people come into my stream they're so and they're excited. shocked. People, no, but people no, no, are no, people come to, to get my coach. Oh, people are excited to get coach. Yeah, it's a novelty thing. You it's know how you know how you said yeah. it's like an experience. Mm. You know, you're in, you're playing solo in front of a big audience, right? You know, but. People come into my Twitch chat, right? Just new people. And they say, what the fuck is this? This is what a waste of time. Is, it, are they, is the person like, just why do you not just review and stuff like that? And then, I'm, you know, I'm things like, yeah, you know, like, I think you're right. I think, I think I'm, what I'm trying to do here is more for the Twitch chat itself. Mm. So again, it's, it's really, I'm actually really excited. Like I'm going down this extra, mm. like I'm really excited to see, we'll put a pin in this, see how this evolves in the next six months or so. I probably won't, we probably won't talk about it again for the podcast yeah. for a while. Um, but that's again where my frame of mind's going. It's how can I make it more for about the viewer rather than the person themselves give value to the, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, the feedback that I got and even just, you know, people who watch your stream, I think it really allows you to see the reality of solo queue. I think in, in a really unadulterated, unfiltered, no bullshit way. It's like, this is what the gameplay looks like. This is what you're going to experience. This is the type of mistakes these people at this ELO bracket tend to make. This is the level of play of the average player at this ELO. You know, it's kind of like a full in-depth look of what it really looks like. No bullshit. Because no cherry picking VODs, That's right. nothing. And I think that it does have that benefit, right? Mm. Which again, I think benefits everyone else in, in, in the stream. But, you know, looping back to my experience, I... The, the, the overwhelming feeling I had during it, it is just like, I'm not, there is so much downtime. You know, I, I, look, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not, it is, it would be a skill. Life coaching is a differing skill. It is straight up a differing skill. It is not the skill that I've developed. Um, so the question then becomes for me, is this a skill worth developing? Is this, Great question. Is this, is this a worthy investment of my time? Is there... You know, the way I'm viewing it, every hour that I'm putting into this, it's like, hmm, well, that's an hour where I could have actually made a better, like a a video or a piece of content or something something else. Mm. And every time in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, sure. It has some entertainment value. Yeah. There's an, there's an element of getting the community involved outside of our programs, which is stuff we don't really usually do. You know, I guess there's an element of, like you said, again, getting an in-depth look at what the real League of Legends experience is. Speaking from a mid laner's perspective, it's not it's I, it's not for me, mm. and I'm not going to even speak for all mid lane coaches. Just for me, it's not for me. I I don't I don't enjoy I don't enjoy it. I don't I don't think the medium is overly effective for mid lane. I think that I don't want to say anything because I don't want to impede their play because I know for a fact it will. And the marginal benefits that they will get from me giving them advice about stuff, 
won't outweigh the downsides, nor will, and again, there's just too many, too many, too many moments where they're in action where I don't want to say anything. And that's just, that's just how I feel. And so my gut feeling is that it's just not an efficient use of time. And there are many, many more effective ways to teach mid lane specifically. There's many better things, you know, and I'm just spitballing Like people say, well, what outside of coaching, like things like compiling a bunch of situations, like quizzes. It's like, okay, here are 10 situations we're going to break down. And getting the, the 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 Twitch chat involved, like this was an idea, like that someone said, like maybe you get all these VOD questions that you've answered in the past, because you know you know we have our VOD question channel in our Discords, make these into like kind of um, you know a who wants to be a millionaire type thing. This is the clip. Ooh, you've got A B C D. Okay. Get the the Twitch chat involved. What would you guys cool. do? So that's kind of an idea that I'm playing it's like with. A game show, like type a game thing. show. Where it's like different because oh, mid lane cool. is a lot about all these decisions. Like, okay, mm. what should we do with the wave here? What should, should you know? What should we be going for this roam here, or should we not? Like, like that's something that I can get the the community involved with, but doesn't require me to just sit there and impede their play. Because I think mid lane is, you know, it's interesting because junglers. I feel like you want them to think more and you want them to to be more active. For mid laners, I think it's more. I just want them to be more intentional with things like i want them to th- i want them to think more but i want them to think more after the game in a way like i want them to really make sense of like what are the real consequences of your decisions and i and i don't think you can get across that that well in 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 the game it's more of a post game i really truly believe in the post game so um that's where i'm at i'm just i, I, I so i think for me that ship sailed i've given it a crack yep. i felt it yeah it was worth it which a is interesting because that is what we thought would probably happen yeah. you know we discussed that like we think i don't know if this is possible for mid lane because there is way less lull states you're not hitting jungle camps that's right the, look so people i know people have been referring me to Bwipo. so Bwipo, have you seen his, how he does his no i haven't so, so top I've, laner yeah, so Bipo does top lane kind of coaching. And I think he does, it's like a package. Like you pay like a, a decent amount, like 300 bucks or whatever it is. Or 250 bucks or whatever. Um, and then you, he does like a pre-game like chat, like about theory or your OPG, I don't know, something like that. Then he does the VOD, but he's like not super hands-on. Like like, like kind of what like, Oh, you mean like he, they play the game? They play the game. Okay, he, coaching, he does yep. live coaching. Yep. Like again, he's not super like hands-on, but he'll say things to help you. And then they review it together. Mm. Or something. It's like it's like a multi-step thing. It's like a whole the package, whole yeah. package. Yeah. Like that's like another way of doing it. You do the yeah, you do like one that a person lot. at that's a time. Really cool. It's like an in-depth yeah. one person at a time. Like you do maybe one person per stream or whatever the hell it might be. Um, and that's another way of approaching yep. it. Yep. Well, so, that's that's again what we said that live coaching is like a comp. Compl- a compliment. It's a compliment to the review. The review. Yeah. You can't skip on the review. Yeah. You know that's like the whole package. You know. Um, but yeah, that's an option as well. These are all different options. All I'm going to say is that for now, I'm ruling out the whole live coaching thing. Love it. Yep. So that's where I'm at. So put a pin in it. Yep. I'm going to keep evolving my little gladiator Coliseum arena me- method. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I enjoyed it, dude. I love it, dude. I actually have so much fun. I think that's really important. I think it's so <laughs> yeah. important that... Dude, I do it for four hours every day. I don't dude. even know how you do that, dude. I'm exhausted, dude. You must be I absolutely always, I do like dead. a protein bar like in between. It's good. It makes me stimulate my barren brain, dude. It's, yeah. it's fun. It's yeah. really fun. It's crazy. I don't know if it's just I just love jungle that much, but the jungle decision making, again, it's very different to every other role, isn't mm. it? It is. It's a, it's a, again, all the, all the lanes are mini games inside the game, mm. but I think that the, the, the game of jungle is just so different comparatively to any, any other role. Like yeah. there's so much more overlap between all the other roles comparatively to jungle. Jungle's like this outlier. It's just so different. What a unique role, dude. It's a very crazy. unique that's role. in the game. I think League is so cool that it has a you know role. What, like you know that. what it reminds me of? What? It's kind of like in, in football, how you have all the positions and then you have goalkeeper. Yeah. Yes. That's it's, a good. You know, it's, same, it's like yeah. goalkeeper. It's like yeah. I guess there's some kicking, you know, and there's yeah. some a little <laughs> bit of passing and stuff. But like they use their hands, man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, on, and no one else is using their hands. No. And there's like the midfielders, the defense, the strikers. You've got everyone else who's kind of like similar, very similar skill sets. And then you have the goalkeeper. That's kind of like that's such a good analogy. Jungle dude. is like the goalkeeper of league. Of, or, yeah, of because you have a different skill set. A different skill set completely mm. you're viewing the game differently you're just yeah you're in a different well, it's the position. same even as in, in, in a lot of sports think about it's like the quarterback in a way mm. the quarterback it's like it's such a unique role compared to every other role on that on the on the field right mm. different it's like this outlier role kind of cool it's cool i'm excited yeah. I, love, I love that i'm a jungler 
All right, so live coaching. There you go, guys. That's an update. All right, Curtis, we'll move on to a bit of a little mini solo queue update, Curtis. I want to share with people my experience over the last couple of days. One, so then people can more relate to us because they think, again, they think that you and I are just some sort of like ascended you know, perfect mental monk gods. You know, you know I say this in our programs, yeah. they don't. The, I yeah. think the, the general public, yeah, the general public, public I think in, well. in our programs, yeah. when, because we stream out, I don't know how often yeah, you stream, stream, stream yeah. solo group. Like people see me like go like zero six on stream and shit. Yeah. yeah. Like I think in our, in our uh, communities, they know that we're just humans and we're not like, you know, we're just having a crack. We're just having a crack like everyone else. Right. Um, but I think from the outside, yeah. Like if you're a casual PPC listener or you, you're not in our programs or you're from a different role, you might think that. Just a little like note there. Yes, love it. And also as well, I want to um, show people again the power of the three block method. All right, so getting up my OPGG here. Quick summary, I've lost 200 LP in the last two days, 48 hours. That's pretty crazy, right? So... Um, uh, I finished this my three block the other day. I went... Oh, so I only played two games that day, right? So two games, bam, two zero block. Okay, moving on to the next day here. Um, I went... I did a three block. I went zero three. And then I played two more games later at night. And then I went one one. So, you know, it's like, okay, you know, yep. zero three blocks happen, right? I won't really get too much into you know, those games. Obviously, I, I made lots of errors, those games. Cool. And then the next day... So remember, one zero three blocks, one thing. The next day... I go zero and four. So I don't even play a three block. I go zero three and I'm like, okay, I've had ridiculous games. I'm going to get a fourth game. Mm. in. And my last game of the block, I went 16 and three. Oh. All right. So this is the brutality oh. of solo. Queue. Holy moly. So let me quickly tell you what happened in the, in the, fir- in the, in the, in the games. The first game I went four, four and five. I played Rexai every single game, by the way. Um, and I failed to, to get Kale further enough behind. I played for top. I was looking for just dives on the, um, the, the Kale did good, but I missed a couple more opportunities. The Kale should have been down like 50 farm mm. should have easily been able to win that game. So I, I ruined that game. Mm. I definitely had opportunities to win the next game. I played me. with you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And uh, I think I ruined that game. Yeah. That was me. I ruined that game. Yeah. So I got level two. We FF'd maps. at 15 minutes. 15 it was minutes. absolute stomp. I think it was something like zero kills, like one kill to 16, 17. Yeah. We had three losing lanes, which was a disaster. And yeah. Yeah. We had three losing lanes. And like I got caught off guard by level two gang mid. It was like it was not intentional gank, but it was like a cross map. Belveth yeah. started his Raptors, crossed over to your Raptors. I was trying for one off an aggressive. Uh, play style into the Akali early which I wouldn't normally do because I, I was trying to like, go for like an early shove into an early like tempo reset but then Belveth level 2 ganked me when I was heavy leaning on that side I get completely chunked lose both my pots wave shoving out I'm getting zoned it was like end of review yeah, like it, yeah. it, like game's over, the game's over and we can't because we can't even contest the 2v2 because you have no threat onto Akali no. so your champion is not good into Akali I can't do anything anymore. I've even got, I think I even had a scaling setup as well. We can't 2v2, so my, I'm just screwed. I, I think, think I went for a, a gank and it was so, it was close. Close, but and it was then just it just, so that's hard. where the game absolutely exploded. Yeah. yeah. I went for a level three gank mid, but yeah. then he was there. So that game me. from, like, if I look at that, because it's so interesting, because that's such a unique experience. I'm in it, so mm. I know what you experienced. Yeah. That's an auto loss. Yeah, that's right. Like, from, I, from your I, perspective, I didn't get to play not the from game. mine, yeah. from your perspective, yeah. it's an auto loss. That's right. I didn't get to play the game. No, you didn't get right? to play the game. So, yeah. so think about it. So I'm just thinking, I'm going through the block here, guys. So yeah. my first game, I... Um, it's on you. It's on me. Yep. The second game, okay, I couldn't play the game. It's like, okay, then it happens. It happens. You get you you know? games. Yep. And then the third game, I, I go five, seven, and 12, but I want to quickly just go over some points again i view it as i didn't get to play real league of legends okay. this is why i played a fourth game so already this is what happens quickly go over the other game this is just a level one kerfuffle right it extended level one we wait what what happened wait they're wait, just why late invading they're oh they late invaded on my, on my red buff i'm just trying to start my red buff so i was chilling my red buff and then they just come in mm. and we do this just absolute shenanigans right but is this something you can avoid like like can you just like I could just start the could other you, side. Could you start the other side? Yeah. Because, like, you can't... I mean, again, like, this seems really unfavorable for your champions. Though. It is. Graves is good at, Graves is good at doing something. You have, like, a Nami mid. Don't... Anyway, don't worry about that, Curtis. Right. This situation actually works out good for us because okay. we actually get a kill here, right? We play this really smart. We go back and forth. Look at that dude. Think about it. We're all level one fighting at two minutes. It's just mm. absolute mm. shit show of a game, right? Okay. We got first part Nami. I have a Nami mid, by the way. A bit mm. weird. Mm. 
And then I ruined the game here by doing red buff. Gra I thought Graves had to base and he comes back and pushes me off this. Uh, so then the next, the remainder of this game, guys, so hard. is me getting chased around like a headless chicken and just going back. I couldn't even do Raptors. I, I fucked up the wolves up to yeah. recall. So just this most ridiculous game of all time, yeah. right? <laughs> and it gets even better than that. So and then I'm going to his you're top four sets. Yes, but you've 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 got one you've got one camp by four minutes. I'm level two by four minutes. That's right. And Jay, Grave, me, Graves and I just chasing each other on the map. Mm. He's trying to deny me camp. So it's just this ridiculous mm. game. Like, it's like a mini game. It's like a little mini game. And like these things are rare. You've got to adapt. You know. And the, the day that's actually not the reason we lose this game. Mm. I mean, I bust my balls. So I, this is the thing. I bust my balls this game. I'm telling my team. My team wants to ff. I'm saying, guys, we outscale, mm. which we do outscale theoretically. So if you look at our team comp, um, we've got Ash, Sona. I've got a Malphite top. I mean, Malphite, we were just one-shotting Zeri. Zeri couldn't play the game. I'll flash on Zeri and Malphite. So I view this as we outscaled. Wait, what? Um... With the Malphite and the Sona Ash, front to back. Because how do they... If I just sit mm. in W, I can just peel back and Zeri's the only threat. Maybe not. May, maybe well, not. I wouldn't say you outscale, but like, I, I mean, it's not an unwinnable game. Anyway, that's what I'm going to say. We, yeah. we, we, we came back hardcore, dude. Like, we all, yeah. like, we aced them, dude. Mm. We were popping off. Like, mm. I was busting my balls. I was trying really hard. What did I say here? I said... Um, uh, I was just trying to get my team to motivate because everyone was saying FF mm. at 15. Mm. So I was like, okay, prepare dragon. And then I, yeah, I stuff up a little bit. We lose a Baron there and then we get some, more, okay. And then we die. And then again, my team wanted FFs. But I tried, I put a lot of energy okay. into this game, right? And the beginning, it was a really weird game. So this is my third game of lock. I'm now 0-3. I'm like, okay. Mm. I didn't get to play that game with Curtis. I mm. felt like that game again, I didn't really get to play properly as well. Because I had a Nami mid. Yeah. It just didn't feel like a normal game. So it feels like so this far, you've had kind of like one game out of three. That's three. That's been kind of felt like it was a, a game of League of Legends. That's right. Yep. So then I get my fourth game in here. Yep. I'm like, okay, I'm going to really focus. I'm going to bust my balls. Mm -hmm. All right. I actually didn't get to, I forgot to record it. So okay. I have to go into the replay here. Um, so how yeah. are you feeling mentally at this point? I was fine though because I played pretty well in that mm. third game. Mm. Like I'm doing as much as I can. Like mm. I'm, I'm busting my balls. I'm playing at my skill level. Like I'm. I feel like that tilting for me. Unless I'm playing, I get I'm playing those support blocks. It, I don't really think I tilt that much anymore now. Like everything in the game yep. makes sense to me. All right, now I'm just gonna go to a screen grab here. This game. I began busting my balls. I'm 10-0 on my team, right? Yep, your balls are well and truly busted. <laughs> I've got an Ezreal uh, Yumi, you know, so you think, you know, that's insane scaling. The enemy brand's 0 and 10. <laughs> yeah. um, this Talon here is sort of keeping them in the game. He's done some really smart picks and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, we get Baron. We get Baron, basically just really simple. I don't really have to go over too much. Um, we go for a push for this inhibitor. Um... I'm actually surprised the gold lead's only 5,000, by the way. I didn't actually know that in the game. I thought we were 10,000 gold ahead. Um, we get an inhibitor. Like, this, we should have got multiple inhibs. We should have got triple inhibitors with this Baron. But you see just random fights happen. I sort of kill the Talon there. We're in their, basically, we're in their base. Everyone's sort of done. It's just a kerfuffle. We try and end the game. It's a shit show, right? Yeah. And then this is just the classic, like, you know, we all die, give lots of shutdowns, the gold league closes. Is, but I will say something about What's this, up? right? I am really strict on like that sieging shit. Yes. Like that's that's like on you. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Like you need to take control of that situation. Yep. Like I should be pinging back off yeah, instantly. Pinging back thing. off. After the inhib, yeah. really. Yeah. You could just disengage, reset, take cams. Play yeah. drag, right? and this is the typical. Um, you know, you just get a little Got bit overconfident, a little bit confident, or like you know, uh, I'm sitting there. Can't so, lose this game. So again, I'm busting my balls. I kill Graves there, and then we even I get Dragon Soul too. So I've got we got a 27 minute Dragon wow. Soul, right? So yeah. I've got every objective, every Baron. I'm I'm 11 and 0. I've GA, and then yeah, the game sort of just evolves. I don't really play up, up with my team. Just people are getting caught. No one's together. Like you look like I'm fighting top side here with my teams in base, mm -hmm. and it's just the typical like you know how everyone's death times are desynced. Yep. My thing, thing, and yeah, I, I misplay a lot of these fights, and then the game just devolves again, and then this, and then they just out. It just sound like complacency. Yeah, absolutely yeah, complacency. Yeah. And th think about that. So I had a free win on my hands, mm. and I lost now the free win. So I'm zero four. Mm. And again, the day before mm. that, I was zero three. And guess what, guys? I, I have to get off the computer now. That's it. I'm done for the day. Done. No more solo for today. I need to go back tomorrow. That's mental. Right? Warfare. And I've lost 200 LP. And this is the most, the biggest drop I've had all season, by the way, in two days. So that is the reality of solo queue, guys, and my solo queue. And this is where, again, the three block system is OP. Because that would make you play four games. But again, I get an extra game because I mm. thought I didn't get to play League of Legends mm. for, you know, mm. and I had time to get an extra game in. 
So, what do you take away from this, Nathan? Um, what are your takeaways? Take what are your is, learnings? Well, obviously that one's good. You know, you don't get complacent. All right. There was good learnings from that one from the cow game where I could have mis-executed thing. But you know the, the bigger picture learnings? Yeah, big picture. Back to work tomorrow. You know, that's it. Mm. This is it. This is the ranked journey system. At the end of the day, I'm reviewed on my games. It all makes sense. You even talked to me about the Talia game. That made sense. Yep. I was a little bit confused with that game. So you telling me what happened mm. that helped a lot. Because then I could tick off that one. And it's again, just back to work. I'm not having some mental explosion. Oh my God, my season's mm. over. Mm. I've lost 200 LP. I'm never going to get back, back to challenge again. Yeah, it like it's very difficult for me to now win 3-0, 3-0, get all that LP back. Like this might, I might be set back in LP wise, theoretically, maybe another two, three weeks. But there's nothing I can do about it, mm. uh, you know? You know, I just got to keep chipping away. Yeah. No, I love, I love that you share this because I think that this is, again, the, the brutal reality of the Soul Hue journey and that people watching this need to know that they're not alone in their struggles. No matter how smart you are about the game, no matter how good you are at the game, like you see pro players go on lost streaks. You see people like, you know, us like full-time coaches essentially going on lost streaks. Like the game always has a way. Of, we said this the other week. Like the game oh, always has a way you. of humbling Absolutely. you. Absolutely. At, at every turn. And... Yeah, I think it's really, really good that you share this. And I'm sure many people watching this resonate. And again, this is where people will get broken. They get broken. This yeah. is where people go onto another new accounts. My MMR is probably a little bit messed up now. Um, my gains are going to be, you know, ruined, whatever people say. And, um, you know, as well as if you don't have the three block system, people imagine going at 16 3, queue up again, mm. queue up again, queue up again. I got to get that LP back. Mm. But the day is done, we move. And this is where the process, the three block, everything we talk about, broken my content, yeah. is so powerful. Because again, I'm not even tilted from this. The decision making makes sense. Again, I could have easily won that game. I was, I was handed a free win. But, um, and you know, you, you know what the, the thing is here? It's very difficult to be objective about what's actually happened in these games. And this is where, again, the block, you know, the playing in blocks and then really reflecting, like just being, reflecting the next day. You're not going to be able to do it that night. You're not going to be able to do it even sometimes even the next morning. Sometimes you're just going to have to wait, sleep on it, chill, wait till you're ready. Then we can take a look. You can look at those past few games. You can get someone else to take a look at it if you need to. I've had that. AJ has, I've had AJ, you know, my in my Discord say, can you help me take a look at these games? What do you see? And sometimes, you know, you do need to just step away. And I think that's really, I think if I've learned anything in my journey, it's it's not trying to I, it, it instantly review. Because I know that if I instantly review sometimes, especially when you have these really brutal blocks, you're not going to get the learning. Yep. And you're going you're gonna to delude yourself. You actually run the risk of, there's kind of this quote that's really interesting I heard where, you know, the it was like relating to like the hard work grind culture. Where it's like hard work, hard work, hard work. And, you know, um, in relation to league, you know, play, review, play, review. Well, if you're working really hard, sometimes you're working really hard, but running in the wrong direction. So you think you're running, you're doing a really good job by running, sprinting really fast, but you're actually, you could be running in the wrong direction. So you actually could be setting yourself backwards. And sometimes if you play and review without reflecting, what you're actually doing is instilling bad habits because you think there was one reason why you're losing but in reality, it was a completely different, different other yeah, reason, you yeah. know? And again, you think you're fixing the problem, but you're just blind doing, to Doing more damage problems. to yourself. Yeah, yeah 100%. Right. So yeah, I love it. It actually reminds me of a quote someone um, said in response to, I think it was the last episode, you know, we'll talk about how uh, kind of wishing or not like hoping that even, hoping that the games are hard in a way, right? Or the journey's mm -hmm. hard. There's a quote, it's something like, I'm going to butcher it, but it was something along the lines of, don't wish for an easy life. Wish for the strength to endure a hard one. I love it. That's my favorite. I think it's is it Bruce Lee. I think yeah, it or something like that. Put, yeah, that's insane. You know, that. I think that's really, yes. you know, really relevant yep. here. Yeah, dude. Like, you know, like, if I'm just going 3-0 every block, I would have rated rank mm -hmm. one. I think this is a beautiful segue Boy. into the topic that I wanted to talk about today, Nathan. All right. Let's get to our, we're getting to our major topic. Of the we're day. getting to the, the juicy stuff. So... I think an important question, well, there's two important questions that I want to raise and kind of flow on from. The first one is, what, is it to, what does it take in terms of underlying skills and traits as, at an individual level to be successful in solo queue? But then also, like, what, what even is solo queue at the fundamental level? Like, what, and I'm talking League. Let's just League. What, is, what, what even is the game of League of Legends, okay? So I want to start by talking about, you know, there was a, a term I heard life and you know i think this was actually in in reference to war 
right? Well, this is again th a throwback to Jono and, and Jono, our mentor, back in 2017. When he saw leak, he saw war. He thought it was a military game. The same military concepts like fog of war. A term for war, people say, or when they try to describe what war is, it's actually a complex adaptive system with feedback loops. Okay. okay. Now to break this down, essentially, I remember Jono, he used to be obsessed with the idea of feedback loops, the OODA loop. And so think about feedback loops, right? So you, when you make a decision, no matter how small in league, you, you have an input, you get, there is some sort of feedback the system gives you, right? Let's make it as simple as a last hit on a minion. You cast this auto attack or you press this button, you get the gold or you don't. In the, in the scenario where you get the last hit, you see the bing, the little gold pop up, get your 13, whatever gold or whatever it is. And then you've just in a way completed a very miniature for, oh, I put two and two together. I do this. I get that. Great. That You've actually can kind of completed a miniature feedback loop. League is a game, or and this is again for life. This is a game for war. Sports. Everything is a feedback loop. Everything is a feedback loop. Anything can be broken into some sort of a feedback loop. And this, is, this ties into a deeper discussion about dopamine and how you, you do something, you get some dopamine and that reward, it's like a reward uh, a reward system, right? Or like a pain reward system, pain pleasure. Right? Everything in a way is kind of pain pleasure. And so anyway, that's like, I want to just raise that, like that framework of thinking of the game, thinking of league in terms of these feedback loops. Now, the next level to that is that in, in, in life with humans, when humans are involved, the variables are off the charts because you can't account for every, every variable. It, it's, comb it's combinatorial in the sense that each decision that you make in league changes the outcome, the, the, the future outcome, the potential future outcomes. So if I trade onto the enemy and they're lower, we're in an alternate reality, in a reality where I use my Oriana R for lane control and their chunk to half HP completely changes everything else in the game. Now, maybe the jungler might want to come mid because they're, they're actually low. Maybe my jungler won't want, uh, won't want to invade and said gank mid. Maybe their jungler won't do dragon because they realize mid is low. Maybe that means that in a minute's time, I get more prio because they're low. See what I mean? So one decision, one simple decision changes every other potential outcome in the future. So when you're playing a game like League, it's it's infinitely complex because of the amount of variables and the amount of com possible combinations of events actually occurring. And I guess it's not just about the actual things happening in the game. It's all the, the possibility. human psychology aspect of it as well. And that as well, yeah. You know, you know you, how could you account for, you know, a minute 25, someone to, you know, their mum suddenly talking to them and they get right. distracted or something. You know, there's so many things. And on top of that, Tying back to the military, fog of war, right? Fog of war by concept is one of the main reasons that makes League so difficult. You don't know what you don't know. Everything is inherently a game of chance. It's like in your mind, you're actually making like guesstimates at every point in turn. It's like, okay, based off what I see here, it's probably like, you know, internally, it's like, okay, there's probably an 80% chance that something happens there. So in order to have success with League, you just need to make the highest percentage play in every single moment mm. and then have the ability to execute upon that. Yeah. I guess it's sort of like you think about it, it's more of like statistics in a, in a way. Like yeah. you're playing a thousand games. What is the, what's the move that's 80% chance of working across a thousand games? That's actually a way, a way you have to think about your decision-making. Exactly. Rather than, yeah, sure. This 30% play can work, but across 30, a thousand games, that doesn't get you very far. Exactly. And then a lot of our decisions is like, we get feeling, we get inklings about, this just looks like the right play. This is the highest percentage play here. And it doesn't mean it always work, but we know that if we in, in this situation a hundred times, this decision, the fundamental decisions behind, like the variables that you considered and the way you came to that conclusion will lead to success mm. in the majority of games. Mm. League is like one, it's like, it's like every decision in league is kind of like a hand of poker. Yeah, that's right? a good analogy. And if you make the correct, the mathematical correct decision, like statistical correct decision enough and you play enough hands you just win you just have success over the long run yeah you'll win more again you're not gonna have a hundred percent win rate but you're gonna win more than that's you lose. right but the reason why and the people ask why, why, why are you bringing poker into a discussion about league you know what the similarity is there is inherently 
again, a fog of war, if you will. There is a lack of information. We don't have all of the information in front of us. So chess, this is where chess and poker and league are kind of a little bit different in the sense that chess, the variables are in front of you. There is no fog of war. I know what pieces they have. I know where exactly where their pieces are. They know where my pieces are and they know what I have, right? Then, but the, the difference in chess is that there are, yeah, there's, a, I mean, there is an infinite amount I mean, there's like, not infinite, but there's a lot of, you know, probably, I think millions and millions of possible combinations of what could happen. But then also there is that combinatorial, or there's that kind of human interaction, or there's that 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 uh, combinatorial type aspect where I make a decision that's going to influence their decision, and then you, you could be going down a game that you've never played before. It's You're like in a, a scenario war. that yeah, the board is in a situation that you've never seen before. That's possible, and that only happens the deeper the game goes, and that's the same in league. Like in the early game, the early games all. You know, they can be somewhat clearer and similar because like, oh, okay, you know, there's less variables at play. But the deeper a game goes on in, in a way, there's more complexity because like you, you may have never been in that scenario mm. before, you know? I mean, it's just simple, right? At level one, everyone's damage like a decision is tree. very capped. You have one ability and then more variables, two abilities, level two, level three, level four. People are getting items, damage thing. Yeah, so it's sca the it scales. Variability scales. The variables gets out of control. Yeah. And so, um, so I think it's really important to, to really, what I'm trying to do is lay the groundwork of what really, like if we distill what league is, at a fundamental level, like all these decisions, we've got fog of war at play, we've got kind of complex human interactions, we've got an infinite amount of variables, we've got all, and then there's, on top of that, the ability to execute and then the psychological factors at play, we're just kind of laying the groundwork, right? Now, as, you know, as you evolve, as you get better at the game, you know, you need to be able to kind of confidently say, okay, I'm gonna, you need to be able to confidently stand on two feet and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this decision. And you need to, but you need to do it with guts. You need to, you need, you know how we say play with confidence or why co league is such a confidence based game. It's the reason why is because it's an execution based game. You can have all the theory in the world, but the way league is, is that you got to make that decision in a split second and you got to commit to that decision. You know, you can't half ass it. If you, if you're like doubting yourself going into a play, like in thinking, oh, is this the right play? You're probably gonna mess it up. You're gonna miss an ability. You're gonna miss a window. You're gonna fail flash. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna miss a smite. Something's gonna go wrong. You got to commit boldly to the, de the decisions that you make. So therefore, right, there's a certain amount of kind of commitment mentally that you have to every play. So you need to be able to simultaneously say, I believe this is the correct decision, but then the next moment say, I was wrong. How interesting is that? You need to be able to boldly commit to a play, believe in it wholeheartedly, yet at the next turn, the next second, say, wow, that was actually dumb. Or that something. was incorrect. Yeah. I, I was wrong. Think about that. In a split second, you can go from thinking that you were right and believing in every, every part of your intuition, believing that you're right, and now completely being told or now realizing that you were wrong. Yeah, because, yeah, you, the outcome instantly happens. Yeah, the feedback loop it completes. Completes, yeah. And you see what happened, and yeah. then you have a choice. Now, think about it. Let's bring it back to the feedback loop. You make a decision, an event happens. We see the result. Now, you have a very pivotal part of the feedback loop that needs to fit in. In order to be become a better player, the final part of the feedback loop, you've got to get the learning. You've got to actually look at what happened, you got to be able to figure out what what the what the hell actually happened here, and you got to try and apply that learning again. Try it again, and maybe a different scenario. It's like, oh, I casted my ability this way, I got that result. That didn't quite work out well. I'm going to adjust it a little bit. Try again, and then try again, and then try. You got to be able to complete that feedback loop, and that's what makes I think that's really what the best players in the league do. Whether it's intuitively because they they they're so goddamn curious about the game, they're so obsessed about the game, they or they hate losing. They, ha so they hate much losing they so much they have out. to figure it out. Yeah. They have to complete that feedback loop, yeah. you know. And so you know, really, you know, it's kind of like a, a course correction. It's like a, a never ending course correction. Your journey with league is a never ending course correction. You're just course correcting daily. You're course correcting weekly. No, I mean, and even in a game, you're course correcting moment within a moment. game. Yeah. You're course correcting moment to moment, but you're also course correcting in your journey. It's like micro macro. You, you, you're course correcting in your lane phase and in your pathing and in, in the way you think about win cons and the way you think about your role. 
But then you're also course correcting in terms of what skills you need to develop. What's working with like the way you're viewing your champion. What's working in terms of your mindset. You're course correcting at every, you have to course correct at every moment. Big picture, small picture at every moment. You see what I mean? Yep. And so where does this all, where this all leads? So what does it tie in? Guys? Where does it all ties in? So, so you're sort of at the so groundwork. I'm laying trying to the like groundwork, right? How, what is league at its foundation? How does decision making impact and change and adapt into yep. it? So that, and this is where it all ties together, where in order to be a, 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 a very successful League of Legends player, you need to be adaptable. You need to be able to, like, you need to build up the skill of adaptability. You need to be able to put yourself in a wide variety of scenarios. You need to be able to fail boldly and then adapt, pivot, and just boom and like change your 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 either your mindset, change your belief in something, change your view on something. It's a never-ending game of adaptation. Mm. And you know, you make mistakes, you pivot, you evolve. And you know, um, there's a few quotes here that I got from a, a recent kind of podcast. A few kind of tangents I want to go in. I think the first one is that. You know, you know, we talk about the dangers of being kind of too successful in your journey early on. I think that's very real. And you know why? Again, it ties back to the whole ad skill of being adaptable. So let's say, for example, someone gets, they play the meta. They find a gimmicky little pick and they get a lot of success and they climb all the way up to like a rank, say they were in, in platinum and then they get to diamond. But they didn't really have to sweat for it. They didn't have yeah. to get, go through those really brutal feedback loops. They didn't have to evolve and adapt and be curious and 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 really like you know blood, sweat, and tears and really develop that 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 kind of like grit. When shit hits the fan, they don't have the actual underlying adaptability to that skill to back up. They, they, they crumble. They don't have that. It's mm. like, they're, it's like they're, their house is built on sand. Mm. The, the, the real long-lasting success in league comes from that grit. It comes from that, 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 that ability to adapt to whatever happens. In, in, whether you have that, like you, you're talking about before, your 0-3 block into a 0-4 block. You know, whether it's that your champion getting nerfed, whether it's even in a game, you have a wink on, boom, that wink on dies, you got to, you got to change. Whether you, you get invaded level one, like in that other game, boom, I got to figure out what do I do? You know, if you're weak mentally, you're not ready to adapt and pivot on a dime and, 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 and fail boldly. You just don't have a chance in league. You just will fail. You won't make it. It's like, it's, it's, it's like a dual, it's like a dual die type thing. Do you see what I mean? Yep. Wow. And size into a court where you got to learn to enjoy the taste of, of your own blood. Oh, that's such a good quote. You know? Yeah. You're going to get punched in the face. Mm. You got to enjoy that. You actually have to enjoy getting punched in the face. Yeah, you get punched in the face so much. You get so many zero three blocks. You actually, it's, yeah, you enjoy the taste of your own blood. You enjoy it. It's like, come on, bring on the zero three block, the zero four block, because that's building the grit that's going to allow you to become a deadly player in the future. And that where I think where it gets really important is the intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And, and I think that really successful solo queue, like, like if we're talking, I think long-term successful solo queue players, they can, they can have an, a, they will have a sense of extrinsic motivation. There's no doubt. We all care about the rank. We all love that the challenger or getting rank one or whatever. That, Sexy and, win rank. And all the best solo queue players, they, of course they wanted that. They don't just casually play the game and, 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 and don't care about rank. Of course they care about rank. Of course they want to get rank one. But those players, I believe, the best players, they, they, they've got this intrinsic form of motivation where it's kind of like they're motivated by they're motivated by the learning of new things in itself. It's the, it's the, it's going into the game, figuring out some problems, expressing the, you know, dominating. And then it's, it's not the result. It's the way they go about it. It's the, it's the, it's the journey. It's even though it sounds incredibly cheesy, you know, like the whole, it's the journey, not the destination. In a way, I, I truly believe that the best, the best solo queue players they, they're, they're getting that deep satisfaction from the... It's like dominating a lane phase or something. Is that extreme? It's like the underlying intrinsic? skill. They get okay. the satisfaction from the underlying skill, mm. not the result. And look, it, it, I think it's a delicate balance between two. I, I'm not going to say every player is 
only in you know the best players are only intrinsically motivated but i think for sustained success it has to be there has to be an a huge a huge part of it intrinsic you have to be intrinsically motivated yeah yeah i i don't really know we could explore intrinsic motivation for the players the top players because like think about like a faker yeah right like like there's no way that if they were purely extrinsically motivated that you would be able to sustain you mean ex, ex, extrin- extrin- if it was pure ex, extrinsic yeah external, there's no way you would be able to sustain that level of yeah i mean that's like where it goes down to like the money and like all that sort of stuff he's the got, money he's, and the fame he had the title he had the yeah. you know it can't that can't be it. Yeah. It just wouldn't work. Yeah. There's something about the competition. There's something about the game. The I game. think it's the game. It's yeah. like the the love of playing the game, the love of competition itself, the love of whatever. I mean, there can be many forms of like, yep. you know, extra intrinsic forms of motivation. Even just like the, the, and I think for us, I think we are in a way, you know, we're definitely extrinsically motivated by, you know, dominant, trying to get high rank in the ladder. But I think, I mean, I'm not, I think I know for a fact, both of us, we're obsessed with that idea of just like being competitors. It's like the journey is the destination, the process, the the putting in the blood, sweat, and tears. That's yeah. the fun part. That is the fun for us. part. Yeah, that is what makes it addicting. Yeah, that's a, that's the addictive part of league. Yeah, you know, and so yeah, this all ties into just getting great at decision making under uncertainty. It's all about adaptability. It's all about completing those feedback loops. It's about. Um, yeah, I mean, this is that's what I that's what I believe upon my reflection, inspired by this this podcast I listened to. Um, I think that's really what it takes. I think that's the future of League of Legends players. That is the future. We may not be there yet, and I think there's inklings of it, and I think we're getting there. But at the you know, if you really distill all the bullshit, that's what it's all about. That's what League's all about. And Jono was way far ahead of his time. He saw this. Mm. He saw this in 2017. Mm. He knows that. He knew it. Mm. He was spot on at every single thing. Oh, we love Jonathan Brown, don't we, Curtis? He was right. And we didn't realize at the time. Like, no, he was we were clueless. We just boomer. thought it was just a video game. He What's this boomer on? talking about? Because he was talking, you know, he was talking at a level that we couldn't actually comprehend. He's thinking so high level, looking down on what the true, the true he kind of... stripping away the game, wasn't He stripped it? away to all its, the crap. To its, to its, its, its bare its, nakedness. Yeah, which is the military, the, you know, all these concepts, the fog war, the the feedback loops, the the ad- adapting to uncertainty, the the complexity of the, you know, humans interacting and the mental game. And he was on it, man. He knew, he knew. He, he really did know what it was all about. Very fascinating topic and segment there, Curtis. Intrinsic motivation versus... Uh, external, I keep calling it external because I literally can't pronounce the word. So external motivation versus internal motivation. Having success early on in your journey, how that's damaging. It's That's a yeah. really good one because... And that explains it in a way though. You know how... Think about what that re- does to your reward system because you think, okay, if I... A champion is the answer, right? Instead <laughs> of process actually figuring out, yeah. learning the game is the answer. Because if you just play the meta champ, get to diamond... Yeah, it goes to shit. Okay, you even though you might be aware of the process, but you train your brain immediately to be like, well, I can just get back to that rank, or I can climb further by just doing that process again. That's been working for and, me. And I actually think it's 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 actually innate. It's biological. I actually think this is the dangers of smurfing, right? Buying a new account. It's actually biological. You've actually trained your brain to get that surge of kind of like dopamine. When you're playing on a new account, you get that giant LP gain, or you climb those ranks. You're, cli- you know, even though you're facing lower elo's opponent, whatever the hell it is, right? It's kind of like your you've trained your brain to to kind of reward itself for doing that behavior. It's like you're viewing it as a positive in a way. And now, when when we when the reality sets in and the pain starts to come, we want to avoid that. We're looking for a way out. Where we want to avoid the pain and go towards the pleasure. And the pleasures again back to the, the smurfing, the playing the meta or whatever it whatever it is. But that is fundamentally cheating the, the true skill. It's fundamentally cheating the true skill. And that and again, you can do it short term. It will not work long term. And I think this is actually a, this is actually what explains. You know, we're talking about how we replied to that BBC uh, mailbag question last episode, and the guy wrote in asking something about um. You remember we had a discussion about uh, you remember he was like a, I think it was a a top laner who got like high elo, 
and then was a one trick and he's like uh, he's asking or oh, no I think he was a mid laner and then um he was saying like should I you know should I expand my pool or something and then we're talking about he was a young kid you remember the young kid the high oh, school kid yeah, yeah and then I spoke about Shern yeah and I was saying how like there's this element of like real like curiosity and like really just thinking about getting better at the game versus LP you know what that is that's the difference between you know, Shern had developed that grit. He developed that, like, he didn't need to... Um, prove anything to anyone. Prove anything to anyone. He actually developed that ability. Once you develop that underlying skill set, you're like, in a way, unbreakable to solo queue. Like, you will always beat the solo queue system. Because once you have that 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 grit, that, that adaptability, then it's just a matter of getting in the reps and you're automatically going to be able to ad get the new skill. That's what adapting adaptability is. And that's why adaptability, we believe in adaptability as like a, a skill for the, or a trait of the new world in a way. Technology is moving so fast. The world's moving so fast. You can't be stuck in your ways. You got to, you got to, you got to figure the new shit out, mm. you know? And I think that's what Shern in a way has. He has like that. He's just got that curious childlike mentality where it's all about just what's next, what's next, what's next. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? It's not about what's happened in the past. It's not about LP or any, it's just the game. It's just the skill. That's kind of what, I think it ties into that in a way, you know? God, I love League of Legends. Oh, uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about before we move on to like the clips and stuff. I got sent this interesting little kind of paragraph. I think it was from an article from, as a, as a, as a uh, most dominant basketball players in the world at the moment. He, I, I'm going to butcher his name. It's like Janus, Janus or Johnny Antokonopolo or something. Something like that. Anyway, there's a, a little bit of an article. I'm going to, we can, I'll send you the clip. You can put it on the screen. I'm just going to read it out. It's a struggle, he said. Okay, we can make excuses. There's a new player. There's a new coach. There's a new system. We can keep on making excuses and think that it's going to be okay. But that doesn't work in life. That doesn't work like that. You have to figure out solutions. And right now, our solution is that, oh, we have a new player and a new coach. And oh, we're going to be better in game 40. No, we have to get better. We have to play together. We have to be more clear on what we're trying to get from offense. We have to be more clear on what we're trying to accomplish defensively and who we're going to let attack us because you've got to live with something. You cannot stop everything. We've got to keep figuring out solutions. Right now, we're not there yet. Hopefully, we can get better in the future. But if we just stay with the mindset that we're going to get better in the future, we, we will not. We have to every day come to the court and figure out ways to get better. I believe that as a team, we will get better, hopefully. Now, why I think this is such a powerful little paragraph is that, you know, and, and what um, Eric here sent to me said, it's akin to league where simply following the process isn't really enough. We have to actively problem solve and be curious about how to improve and then and then practice the execution with purpose. You know, it won't just happen by itself naturally by doing three blocks, you know, or having a small champion pool. Those things are necessary, but not sufficient for climbing. Mm, that's just the baseline. It's the fake process versus the real process yeah. as well. The substance. Yeah, the substance is the, the mindset, the approach to the game, the view of the game. That's right. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, we talk a lot. We've seen a lot of examples of the podcast about people that, that do everything that we say. They follow the three block process. They review every have game. Small champ so have a small chample. But yeah, the substance part of it, when they actually get into the details and break down the layers, you know, they're missing a lot mm. still, you know, view of the game's problem, relationship with the game's a problem. It's very easy yeah, to just think, oh, I'm following the process, just magical things are going to happen. You just roll, you just roll up, rock up, and here's another three block. We're going to rock up, and I've got some learning objective. Nathan set me. I'm going to, you know, let's just see what happens. It's just like, you got to re really be actively engaged. Intensity. That's Int why we talk about play with intensity is so important. Yeah. And it's and it's tough because, again, it's, it's, it's every day. It's like every time you're on the rift, you know, it's... Brutal, it's brutal it's brutal beats you down it beats you down especially when you put into effort and you don't get the rewards that that's that's the thing that will just destroy your ego mm. that's why we league such a good game at, at humbling you beautiful you know to summer school yep summer school time actually no today's not a summer school post curtis today is a main reddit league thread oh wow post. 
So this was a relatively big one this week. We're getting out of our comfort zone, Nathan. This yeah, so big slush our League of Legends. This was three days ago from the time of recording this podcast. This had 500 upvotes and 350 comments. And this is something we've talked a lot about this podcast, Goda. So maybe we just look more at the comments because we have talked about this on previous episodes. Okay. We can do a quick TLDR. Let me just quickly change the camera one yep. second. So the title of this post is Why Do People Talk Down Their Rank? There's always been a trend in league where people talk down their rank, no matter what rank they are. For example, a diamond player will say it's easy to get to diamond. In diamond games, pe- in diamond games, people will flame others for being hard stuck diamond. The reality is, is, is that diamond is the top one to two percent. Being the top one percent in anything is really impressive. Meanwhile, gold players will look up to diamond and tell their bronze friends that getting to gold is easy. This attitude never stops, no matter the MMR. It's just not league either. Even when I was high MMR in Overwatch, I got flamed once for only only being top 500 and not being top 100. The truth is, if you're high silver right now, you're about average, top 50%. So many diamond players will tell you how easy silver is. It's a trash rank. But put that in the perspective of IQ. The top 1% is genius. So imagine someone going into your calculus class saying, lol, this is so easy. How are you not getting this? I did this when I was 11. That guy is just an ass. It's not always with bad intentions either. Some Sometimes people will think it's encouraging to tell someone that climbing is easy. It's really not. It's just demeaning to tell someone that it's easy to climb. I always tell people that they can climb, but it's hard work. If you treat League of Legends like it's a university course and study it, you'll climb. If not, you'll stagnate. But if you find the game more enjoyable that way, there's nothing wrong with that. It's so much of an issue that people will be embarrassed to tell their friends about promoting to gold because they think it's an embarrassing low rank, but really, but it's really not. You're literally better than most league players if you're gold plus. All right, the top comment here with 1.2 up, uh, 1.2 up votes, 1.2 thousand up votes. Bro, Piosic literally won worlds and people still caught his sh- um, him shit at the game. Lol, just ignore these people. So, yeah, I mean, this just comes down to... I mean, at the end of the day, this is a normal... This is not just a league thing. Wait, wait. Did I just... I just want to read oh, this one. Right, uh, lol, right. And my girlfriend watched a few clips from Worlds and was like, question mark, but I've seen so much faster stuff happen in your games. <laughs> How funny is that? Interesting. So, sorry, go on. This is human nature. Like, this is how it works. Everyone wants more. Everyone... Comparison is just a huge part of what we're ingrained to do for one reason or another. You know what people always talk about, you know, rank and stuff, you know, what was this podcast? Go back to the intrinsic, you know, mm. versus looking at the external, you know, rank mm. where I play for rank. You know, league is, when people break down the game for what it is, have fun just playing it, get into the decision-making, all this stuff gets stripped away. League becomes so much more fun. Like, people can always have the argument over and over and over. It's like, you know, what's rank... Um, what ranks good? What's bad? There's actually a really good um, conversation that I actually had in my Twitch stream because we actually this topic actually came up because mm. people will come onto my stream and say, you know, this guy's like Emerald, like ha, ah, laugh. This is what Emerald gameplay looks like and stuff like that. And I always just love the comparison to let's say if you're you know Diamond top one percent, if you're the top one percent as an athlete, right? There's a big difference between sitting in your chair and getting top 1% at league than it is just being a tennis player or like a, you know, a football college football player or something like that. You know, you're in the top 1% because it's like, okay, well, you've got the physique there to show. People would say you've got the discipline, you know, Probably to get to that the effort. Status, maybe. The status, yeah. But they, that's just not there for like to, to get that level of status of being like a, you know, a, just even just a college football player probably doesn't even you know earn that much you've got to be like in people's eyes you got to, to get to that you got to be like rank one in mm. league or like mm. top 10 like the standards are so whack out for mm. league because it's viewed as a just a video game you sit there in your chair playing thousands of games you're just an addict you're just addict behavior so that's why that's really why people talk down to their rank because people view that sitting down and playing thousands of games is not an achievement i think that's one i, I definitely think that's one thing or some other things i, I kind of feel like it's a lot of um what's the word N- naivety like in, naive in the sense that um you know when when the average person climbs in league um you know they they don't actually even know what they're doing they're so numb to to the skills that they've developed they don't actually even know how good they are mm. like that's really i think that i think this is actually the 
the main case, the main reason, right? Like, like think about it. An average person, let's say, let's let's take um, you know the average diamond four level of player, right? They've probably played the game for five, six years, right? A lot of hours, but thousands of hours, right? They so think about that. They put thousands of hours into something, but in their mind, because they were just like having fun and just playing something, yeah. they view those hours as not like like real hours, I guess. And so they 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 they've kind of subconsciously developed, or you know, without really you know realizing it, all these crazy, sophisticated forms of muscle memory like they know the ranges of every champ they know the abilities of every champ they know the damage output of every champ and every item they know so many it's things intuitively there's like intuitively yeah. there is so much intuitive shit that a diamond player knows it's it's mind-boggling like the if you could lay it all out there if we were to sit there and write on a piece of paper all of the things that they are they know and that they're able to do it would be it would you fill up a whole thousands of pages it'd be unbelievable right so these things are so small and so intuitive that it's kind of like they, they're not even aware of what they know. So I think when they look at a, a goal player, it's almost as like, oh yeah, anyone can do it. You can do it. But they just forget or they, they're actually oblivious to what, they've, what they're able to do, you know? And, and I think that to tie this back to, and I think it's also trying good to use like a metaphor and analogy, it's, Again, I think the most obvious one and the most humbling one for me recently, somewhat recently, was when I was teaching my partner how to drive. You know, when you drive and you've driven for quite a long time, it's so much just, you know, the size of your vehicle, you know, you're, you're able to like manage speed without looking at the speedometer. You're able to have such good situational where there's so much awareness. You can collect your mental stack's pretty free, so you can, yeah, because you, you know how to fill and drive. And you know how much, feel. okay, if I turn that much, it's going to, on the wheel, that's going to lead to that yeah, on the ground. Yeah. And and then when I was you know teaching my partner how to drive, it's almost as like overwhelming. Wow, I didn't realize how much I know, how connected I am with the car, like how how aware of my surroundings I actually am to like such a small degree. Like we're talking centimeters, you know, or millimeters. So I think that if all any of us can think about something that they've done a lot, and then you try to teach someone who hasn't had any experience with that, it's actually like if you really think about it, you think, oh, driving's easy. Anyone can do it. Yeah, sure. Anyone can do it. It's just going to take time, time yeah. and effort and practice. Um, so I think that's the main reason, to be honest. But yeah, the other one's definitely real, for sure. Well, we'll look at some more comments here. Um, oh, it was an essay that guy sent me. read that one. Let's look at someone here. This is someone here. As someone who has been to Challenger a few times, I talk it down due to how insanely toxic games in this ELO are. You would think the very top peak of the server were, was purely elite, but unfortunately it's still full of flipping, malice, griefing, and occasional scripters. Uh, sure, take some time to get here, but it doesn't feel as rewarding as Challenger five to ten years ago. Main reason I stopped uh, ranked altogether. It feels taxing to play, not because of the mechanical tryhard and involved. I'm trying... Hard to even remotely care about the game after everyone has threatened <laughs> to uh, do F. some their interesting things to their uh, <laughs> to the parents. <laughs> As for others, happily cheering silver friends getting gold. Also, if they genuinely improve and view it as an achievement, would never talk it down to them. If anything, will uh, pepper them to try further. Only talking down other people that are egoing clowns that toss shit like your randoms. Da, 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 da. Um, I mean, there's a bit of copium going on yeah, there, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to get some different opinions. I think there's a difference between people who flame you and call you hard stuck and people Look, who I, I think there. a lot of the whole de also down talking as well, it can, it can actually come from a negative place where it's like... Um, it can come from like an ego thing as well. I think there is an ego element, right? It's like talking down on other people, like as if you're hard stuck diamond and stuff. It's kind of like makes you feel good about. Yeah, yourself. it's like against. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. It's it, what's that? What's that quote we always say about? You know, hate never comes from a hate never comes from above. Above. Yeah. In a way. No below. No, hate. Oh Jesus! I can't remember what it was. Oh yeah, hate never comes from above. That's right. Yeah. But they are above though. It doesn't apply here, Curtis. 
Yeah, actually, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <does it? laughs> that makes absolutely <laughs> that's no just, sense. That's the worst fucking quote you could ever do. You get as you just stuff this segment up. Pack it in, guys. We're packing it <laughs> in. Right. We don't know what we're talking about, Nathan. Nah, let's just move to the, we've, we've done enough damage. Actually, now. no, no. What, oh, I, what, 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 what I do want to say is that, you know, in a way, yeah, these people aren't above in a way. Like, I actually feel like in a way, like they're, they're, they're I mean, they are, but I'm, I'm more talking about the people that say Hardstock Diamond. That's different. I'm getting confused here because there's a very big difference between someone saying Hardstock Diamond. They usually are the same rank. They are at a very similar level. You know what I mean? Like it's it's very rare that like it's usually a diamond one saying to like a D four usually close, or yeah. like a, or like a just like mm. a master tier zero LP talking to like a diamond two or something. A uh, stuck diamond. It's yeah. like it's you know it's usually they're in the same. So I think there's an element of like insecurity there mm. about or like mm. I don't know. There's something going on there. I don't really know what it is. But that's very different to like someone talking down their own rank they're talking down other people's rank i think that's very very different hmm. so i think it's important to make that dif- that the kind of distinction there oh yeah, the titles why people walk down their rank. yeah their own oh, rank. Their you know what i mean rank. so ah. i feel like we're conflating a few yeah. issues here. oh well it's okay sorry well it's also um it's also like a defense mechanism in his way yeah that's what i'm trying to get across yeah. that's the point i was trying to get across because if you say my rank is bad i'm yeah. bad which is why I lose lots of games. Like it's kind of giving yourself permission to to suck, just to, to like. Yeah, there's something there. I don't know. We need to think about this some more. I don't really. It probably warrants a whole another conversation in, in and of itself. Oh, yeah, no, that's for another episode. We're not going to whip out the, the armchair analyst for today. No. All right, Curtis. Curtis, clip time. Yep. Uh, let's get into the details, guys. And welcome everyone to Curtis's clip corner. All right, guys. So we're going to keep it nice, short, and sharp and concise here. I want to talk a little bit about lane assignments. Lane assignments are deceivingly impactful, mm. right? It's a small thing in the grand scheme of the game, but it changes. You know, we were having this discussion before about how like one decision changes the outcome or like the possible scenarios that you're going to be within. Lane assignments really shape the I game. Have an, I have a saying that I talk about with jungle. You know when your and your bot lane breaks the bot tower and they're meant to be moving middle yep. top? And usually what I see in lower is the bot lane just, they don't know what to do. They break the tower to you, they stay, stay bot. And the mid lane just stays mid. Yeah. yeah. And what I say to them is, okay, no matter what I tell you, the game cannot progress. You can't get anything next until your bot lane moves out of mm, bot lane. I love that. I use that word. Like, Game can't cope. Yep. What do you want to do about it? You can you can sit there. Like I can tell you what to do with the situation, but the game simply won't progress unless yeah. that changes. Yeah, that's I, how important. I totally that resonate with is. that. I say that all the time. And and then the, the the common one is like the feedback again. It's like oh, but but what if they don't listen? And it's like just again, I just I go, when they say that, yeah. I go back to the same statement. <laughs> the game cannot progress until they move. So do with that what you see. Try and get them to listen. If they don't, that's it. Except reality. <laughs> The game will not progress unless they move from bot. I, I just repeat that. And I'd annoy the shit out of people, but that's the reality. What do we want me to say? Yeah, this is the reality. And like, I had this game today where this Annie was 5-0. and She's like the main carrier of the team, right? At this stage. And, and what happens is that she TPs bot and the Shen TPs top and simultaneously... <laughs> Oh, the no. Shen should be bot yeah. and we should be top, yeah. right? What ends up happening p- past this point is that, um, let me just turn this out. What happens from this point is that like the game just doesn't progress. Like you said, because now the strongest member is on the wrong side of the map. And then we just like, I think we like fight bot and then we just stay bot. And I'm like, you're the main member of the team. Now you're Vi. Oh, she's 5 and 0. Yeah, she's a 5 0 5 Annie with like, yeah, this is ridiculous. And, the, and now the Vi is having to play towards the Chen mm. on top side. And then the game just doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, it can't go anywhere. It, it can't, can't, go can't, anywhere. can't go anywhere. You are the wing con, and now you're sitting here trying to like pull Defend waves minions. or whatever the hell you're doing. This looks on- like a Scion. Like I'm watching a Scion playing weak side here. And I'm like, the game is done. The game, we- and, and I'm like, he's like, oh, but like, you know, he says something, but, but, but what if he doesn't do it? I'm like, it's a non-negotiable. Mm. This is a non-negotiable lane assignment. It's like, and, and you know what I said? I said, I would rather you go, because well, no, he, what he said, he asked specifically is, what if I go top and he doesn't swap? And I said, I would rather you let Kenan end the game. <laughs> Good, I love it. 
<laughs> give extremes because yeah. that, that's get the message through because obviously that won't happen just let canon end, end the, the base game. end yes. the game and stay top <laughs> yeah agreed I love that I love that that's such a good method in coaching you've got to give people extremes just give them an ultimatum yeah you know and I'm like that's the only way to get it across that's what I felt in the moment it's a non-negotiable and I think that just in general you know getting people I'm trying to get people a little bit excited about lane assignments and taking just be more proactive in mm. fixing lane assignments I'm like okay this is not good we need to first of all recognize that this lane assignment is not good and then more importantly what are you going to do about it because a lot of the time I think people do recognize the lane assignment is not good but they just they just go with the flow they go with the flow they just yeah. go they with the, the flow they don't have the intensity they're scared remember we talked about they're scared about, of people saying no really well scared of people saying yeah scared of rejection that's obviously yeah. a huge thing that we as humans <laughs> hate but also like if I say this and it doesn't work out the way, then I'm the one to blame. Right. right. We've talked about that in a podcast before. People refuse to make calls or want to be proactive. They'd rather be the sheep. They want to fail in a in a conservative in a safe, way, a safe, safe way, rather than fail boldly. Face plant. Yeah. Do oh, I love you know, great. I love my metaphors, Nathan. Skateboarding is such a great a metaphor for this because in skateboarding you you have to you have to commit. So like if you're like trying to like say you're trying to like kick flip downstairs or something, if you don't 110% commit, it will never work. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You will never land the trick. You actually have to venture into the unknown, do something that you've never done before. And and you know what the trade-off though, the downside of that is you're going to, when you fall, you're going to fall badly. You got to, you, and that's what the scariest thing about skateboarding is and why I had to stop doing it is that the injuries that you get are inevitable because in order to, to, to kind of chart uncharted territory and to kind of unlock new tricks, you got to just absolutely treat your body like a rag doll. You got to be willing to break bones. You got to be willing. That's why all skateboarders break bones. You have to do it to unlock that, that trick. And so in league, it's like, you have to have that painful experience. It is unavoidable. You are going to lose the game off a lane assignment. Some guy is going to tell you to fuck off and, you know, not going to listen to you. And you are going to let the cannon end the game through bot side. That is going to happen. Or, you know, it probably won't to that extreme, but like some negative experience is going to happen. But that is the most effective way to learn. It's the only way in a way to learn. And um, it is, is what it is. It's a non-negotiable. So that's kind of my two cents on lane assignments. So something I'm going to be a little bit harsher on moving forward i love it i think it's very important for laners top mid and bot all right mailbag time yep. curtis away we go jingle 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 song all right our first uh, mailbag today comes from nick the title of this email is Embracing the Suck and Doubling Down on the Process. Hello, Nathan and Curtis. I've been listening to the BBC for almost six months and started playing League in December of last year. I really enjoy listening to both of you talk about the process of getting better. I'm a huge American football fan and love the behind the scenes of coaching football and learning about coaching in general. I feel a lot of what both of you talk about relates to all sports slash activities, not just League. My favorite team is the Nebraska Corn Huskers. For the past five years, they've been awful and completely aimless as, as a team. They recently got a new coach this year that constantly talks about the process and doubling down on the process when things get tough or when things are going good. Basically, always double down on the process. They released behind-the-scenes episodes after games, and one of the most recent episodes contained a shot of winter conditioning outside in the snow with a sign that says embrace the suck here's the picture of it oh that's awesome how cool is that it's really cool i'll put that other picture will come up mm. on the on the video as well if you guys want to see the picture for the spotify listeners instantly thought of the bbc and embracing the suck and conditions that you can't control the team has started to turn it around already and every time he gets any questions about winning or future wins, he always talks about earning the right to go 1-0 next week and getting 1% better every day with their process. I don't think they're going to be winning championships anytime soon, but as a fan, I'm very excited for the future and this coach. Is he a possible BBCR? He says, because of the heavy emphasis on the process. Every time I hear him talk, it makes me want to fire up league and get 1% better. Just wanted to share with you the similarities to the things you talk about and how it translates to a completely different area. 
And he says, P.S. I three blocked my way to gold as ADC, but stopped due to life circumstances. I'm hoping to get back on the grind again shortly and doubling down on the process. Love the podcast and keep up the great work. Well, it's no, I mean, look, we, we, we the Broken Back Concept podcast and our emphasis on the process was obviously inspired by traditional sports. That's where Nathan and I got a lot of our inspiration. Um, with the San Francisco 49ers. The 49ers Bill here Walsh. With, with Bill Walsh there and, and um, Bill Belichick, obviously, and um, John Wooden and from other sports. You know, we, we, we got a lot of our inspiration from traditional sports. So, um, you know, and, and we... we uh, We've always respect. I think we've always like really. That's what drawn us to NFL specifically was the coaches. The coaches, right? yeah, that's what you know. Sean was. McVay and stuff like that. Pete we, Carroll, Pete Carroll, Beast. You know, we just got really got obsessed about that. And we, I think that the that sport is just so sophisticated. Been around for so long. They've really figured shit out. They know how to learn. They know how to. They know just how to improve at a very effective rate. Because you just, it's such a brutal sport. You have to like turn things around so quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really, really awesome. And I, I love the, um, earning the right to win, earning the right to go one zero. Mm. I love that mm. earning the right. And like, it's like earn, you have to earn it because that's true that you have to earn the right to every win to every win. You have to earn the right for every kill. You have to earn the right for everything in, in league, like every little thing. I love that. And I, love, I just love the word earn. Earn is so good. It's just, it's just, just a powerful word. You sweat for it. You got to put in the effort, the work. It's not just going to come to you. Yeah. It's not going to fall on a platter in front, yeah, of, in front yeah. of your feet. Welcome to sports and competition. That's what's so beautiful about sports and competition and why it will never go away. It will always yep. be part of human culture. That's right. Love it. Appreciate you uh, writing in, man. Yeah, thanks very much. And hope your team uh, turns around. Yep. Again, it might not be this year. It could be five, yep. ten years, but it looks like they're maybe on track. Yep. I haven't even heard of that team, by the way, so that must be pretty... I, no, I think it's a, a, the, the the division... Oh, below. Like, I think it's I college, I'm okay, pretty sure. Okay, got it. But, I mean, I could be wrong, but... Imagine if it's in the NFL, dude. It's, we are not. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I don't think so, no. All right, next question here comes from Audrey. The title of this email is Dissonance Between BBC Mentality and League of Legends. Hello, Coach Mott and Nathan Curtis and all the <laughs> listeners. First off, I just want to say I'm a big fan of the content you two put out and the work you do in the trenches with the coaching. But the past few months, there's been an uneasy feeling which has built up over time regarding the central philosophy of Broken by Concept and its relationship to the League of Legends environment. I'll keep it brief, but I ended up quitting the MLS and ultimately League of Legends as a whole from firmly believing the improvement process could be better used elsewhere. I failed my original goal and I'm not afraid to admit that. Fortunately, the end result has actually been a net positive, both in new gaming ventures, Street Fighter 6, and within my career. For these reasons, I still keep up with the content from you two. I think the mindset here is of extreme value, but... But episode 169, the lonely experience of solo queue is when the topic of this email all really clicked for me. Why I still listen to the podca- podcast while having moved on to other pastures. The perspective you two have regarding the game is of a hardcore, unfriendly, introverted experience as a medium to harshly self-reflect, address ego, and learn what it truly means to improve. Well, League has the tools for such an environment, for the vast majority, it is not such a setting. And the and right and the right generally want to cast the biggest net possible, which means keeping it as a competitive game, but also keeping it as a potato laptop friendly social game. That to me is why there can be a discourse and thousands of people being upset about League losing communication features, while you two see the game as isolated self-improvement, so that there are no issues. And why, on the other hand, why, why on the other end you can be begging for a robust or at least somewhat useful training mode while directly hearing from a developer that is not worth the resource investment in their eyes. I understand that you two have been challenger for so many years, have a history with pro teams, made a League of Legends coaching infrastructure and such, but I cannot stop seeing a dissonance between your perspective on League and what the game is. With all its strengths and faults, if your four teammates and five enemies are just tools in war you need to utilize to try and win, why even bother having the variation of teammates to begin with? 
why not just play intergalactic war game of StarCraft where you literally use colonies as tools in order to try and win? To me, the teammates are just noise distracting from the improvement process here, similar to RNG and card games. Why ask your clients to get into the details and replays and practice in a game with no tutorial and beyond bare bones training mode when modern fighting games exist with extremely in-depth tutorials? Fantastic replays where you can custom record enemy actions to train against and clean intuitive replay features which show high detail frame data. Why wait in queue and then draft, let alone possible dodges when you can just load up ranked in a single player game and reach the actual match much faster? Why have a solo queue contract when you can have a much more abbreviated contract of if you lost that match, it's 100% on you. Seek to reflect and improve. Just to clarify, I don't think there's anything wrong with the perspective you two bring to League of Legends, far from it. But as someone who has not put in a decade plus of the game, I find it next to impossible to justify applying the process in League instead of fighting games, RTS games, Go, Chess, etc. Aside from the sunk cost and feeling a responsibility duty to address the toxic slash unhealthy narratives within the League ecosystem, are there any reasons you can suggest which make League worth applying the BBC mantra to over the competitive 1v1 games? So, I think there's very... Oh, I love this email. I what a great so email. Really, Fantastic really great. Thank question. you so much, Audrey, for writing this in. I think this is great. Number one, everything that we talk about on the BBC would be way easier to execute and way better to implement in a game like Street Fighter. 1v1. It, it is so... It, you know, games like Street Fighter, you know, these 1v1 games, you know, you, the practice tools are super sophisticated everything is drillable there's drills you can do everything and anything there's no no noise it's all on you it is a much more streamlined much more user friendly experience there's no denying that everything you said is objectively true the reality though is that league is not street fighter and they're different games it's like comparing you know an apple with the, a cake it's just like completely differing things and so i think that the, the reason is that we love League of Legends. We love the design of MOBAs. And the, the four teammates, that is part of the game. That is part of the game. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's like, it's like, why play, why not, why doesn't everyone just play tennis for a traditional sport? Why would anyone play a team sport? Why would anyone play American football? Why mm. would anyone play soccer? Mm. Why? Mm. When you could just play, everything could be better. Like the, the learning journey, the drills, like it's, isolated like you don't need any, it's so much easier to like logistically as well like just 1v1 everything is easier you know what i mean like there's no i mean obviously there's the communication aspect and things like that right which probably you know so that's why that analogy is probably not the per most perfect um kind of comparison my, my my point still stands is that just because something is easier and better in terms of efficiency of improving at something doesn't mean that one wants to play it it's like again league is a very very unique game in the sense that there are so many ways to express yourself you could say the same thing about street fighter there's many many characters but then you don't get that there's that unique feeling in league where you're just it's like it's like you're one person in and on a map where you got to do a lot of small little things that influence the way the game it's like it's like a game of war rather than a duel like think of like Street Fighter as like a jewel. It's like one on one I combat. Imagine, it's, like, I like it. yeah. it's like if we're gonna use the the real life and I was just like, okay, me versus that guy, it's like fencing or something. Whereas like when you play League, it's like you're one person in a war, like in an army. It's, it's like cool. it's cool. It's like cool. you're like one person yeah. in a way. Yeah. And, and how you... Because, like, yeah, you might not interact with... The, let's say if you're actually in an actual war, you've got someone on the other side there yeah. doing their own little battle, but you know you're all part of this one yeah. battle. Yeah. Yeah, there's something about there's something that. Something about That's that. That's cool. Like, even though there's not a social experience yeah. like that, and, and I think what they're saying a lot is like, why why do we have such a a individual approach to the game? Uh, you know, just why don't you just not do play other games? Yeah, but like we we have like having an individual approach to the game. That's how you improve. That's how you improve. But, but it not, is. It's not really how we're playing the game. No, right? it's it's. I think that people took it too extreme, too like the way we're yeah. thinking about the game, like especially the way that I play the game specifically. I mean, it's a psychological approach to everything. Like when me and you play the game, we know we actively know we have nine other humans in the game. Humans, people. We people know that, there's nine yeah, other people yeah. that have their own their own way of playing the game. 
uh, their own agenda, their own psychological and mental state. We know this. We're hyper aware of this yeah. stuff. That is how you play league. We know who's tilted, who's snowballing, who's feeling good, who's likely going to carry the game. We know all this stuff. We're processing all this information. But for the sake of learning and getting across the basics of the game and... It's it, it you know we you, we I I am not gonna loop you into this I use the your tool because it's a very it was just a simplistic analogy or a metaphor to get across like you know viewing everyone as having a function in a game every champion has strengths and weaknesses and you can play to those strengths and weaknesses or you can you're not you can deny them you know so I think that like again the the crux of this is that league is just a game that is fun for some and not for others I really think it's that simple and um. You know, there actually is no... I actually don't even think there is a logical... I'm not playing League for logical reasons, I would say. Yeah, no. Like, I didn't logically choose League. <laughs> yeah, you, like, broke down, like, this is the most optimal thing. I like individual experience, so I think. It's just, yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's just fun. Yeah. I think that's it. It's like, we need to play this game. We want to be really good at this game because we find it fun. Yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. And, and I, but I will say, in general, there is something to be said about overcoming adversity. Like, doing something that's incredibly difficult... Like, you know, um, you know, being being great at a game like League is incredibly satisfying. Yeah. And having more people in the game is more variables would make it, makes it harder. really difficult, makes really it hard. And that's fun. Yeah. And I we I love the mental I getting like the mental aspect of it personally. I mean, I've come to enjoy that. We've come to enjoy that. We've come to enjoy the the mental battle versus yourself. Mm. And look, and, and I and I want to really state that. I want to make it be very clear here. And I'm sure you know you you agree with this is that league isn't for everyone. We don't want. We're not here to. This podcast is not about getting people to play league. Our goal is that people who are already playing league to have a better relationship with league and get more out of it. And if that means quitting the game, that's success for us. Mm. Because we, we helped you identify that League is not the game We for you. want you to either go one or the other directions. To, if you're going to play League... Either respect the game. Respect the game. And this is kind of the rules that you got to play and understand the rules of the game. And actually, like... This is actually what I found in the MLS program, by the way. I actually had a conversation with this this morning. That the biggest challenge I found with my Blow Platinum program is getting people to actually accept the rules of the game. Mm. Like, this is what League of Legends is about. Like actually mentally coming to terms with that idea that League is this inherently chaotic, snowball-oriented game where you have limited amount of control. Like like actually coming to terms. And it's like the terms of condition of playing League. So like you that is the hardest part about getting people results in the MLS. It's actually not the it's teaching the of the concepts. The teaching, it's not yeah. the theory. It's, it's, the it's the not mindset. even the muscle memory. It's the mindset. Yeah. It's like this is a fucking hard thing. This is the hardest thing you've probably ever done in your life. And like, just having, but like accepting that once you've accepted the rules of the game, then we can actually play and we can actually start improving, you know? So I think that that's kind of tying into that. And like, again, sorry, tying back to my initial point is that we want people to go one or two ways. They give you in, understand what the game is about. And in order to have a healthy relationship, what we believe to have, have a healthy relationship with the game, you've got to understand these things or okay, you know what the game's about and then you realize it's not for you. We're happy either way. We want that to be the case. You either play it or you don't. There's no like kind of no in between, you know? Um, and so I, I don't want I don't want people listening to this podcast viewing it as like, oh yeah, we're we're Riot's marketing arm and we want them to we're encouraging people to play league. Not really at all. If anything, we're dissuading a lot of people from yeah. taking their we're ranks. Showing their harsh reality. Yeah, their harsh reality. If you want to improve play ranked, this is the realities. So I, I, I think that um yeah, the the to kind of TLDR a lot of this, a lot of it's not even l logical. I just love League. Mm. That's it. That is the reason. If I were to answer why, that is why. And that I think there's a lot of people who come to our program, that is why as well. And I think that there is one aspect of why, by the way, why League over StarCraft or one of these other games, you can, you can play with your friends in competitive settings. And then you may say, oh, that's a giant contradiction. Well, it's not because we say, if you want to improve individually you play solo queue but if you want to compete and, and 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 competing in like a clash or a local land tournament or a high school tournament or whatever the hell it might be that is your that is where you ex, that's like the that's the stage that's kind of like the coliseum if you will that's when you 
You've done. Execute. You've put in the work in the gym. There's and no now improving there. No That's now yeah. the execution. Yeah. There's the dojo, and then there's the center stage. You know, so people want to play with their friends. They want to win clash. They want to, you know, they want to be in that team kind of setting. And it is a inherently a team game in a way when you play in that competitive setting. We're not denying that. We're denying it's a team game to improve. It's not mm. a team game to improve. Mm. It's a solo effort to improve. Mm. Um, so I think it's an important distinction there to make. Is there anything you would add there? Um, yeah, just going into a big picture of the question. She says, so yeah, so why, yeah, why are you so harsh on thinking that the game's a solo game? I mean, just talking about the way I play the game, I view the game, like... I, yeah, again, going back to the, I need to use my teammates to win the game. I can't, I, me with the jungle, the way I play Rexiles was I play around a win condition, play, and I understand they're human. But I, you know, at the end of the day, Lee is so structured though, the way that it works is that I have to be executing my role. That person needs to be executing role in an individual. I can't influence their behavior that much, you know, like, so there is a, well, you got to view it like that to have a healthy relationship with the game, but I am. I still do love the social aspect of just four players on my team, but also there's five players on another team that I'm out destroying and out jungling. I love that. If it was just a one versus one, like think about this five people. Like I, I actually like in in my mind. I like I've just like let's say if I play a game out of my mind, I play insane. There's five people that I've influenced their journeys on. Mm. You know, that's you beat so five cool. people, not one person. Yes. In a way. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool aspect of a game it that cool. I don't think they talked about in the email. You know, it's not just about us. It's like I'm beating five people. I'll also another thing as well. I kind of like I love playing a hard game, like League. Like I, I like we. Like I want. I feel it feels kind of cool to say that you're kind of playing the hardest game in a way. Mm. You know, like, mm. it's like, okay, this is my hobby. I don't know, there's something there. At least for me, and this is not for, for any other people. But like now knowing, like getting deep into it, it's kind of cool to to know that this is the, one of the hardest games you could possibly play. Yeah. And there's something, just something cool about that. There is something just cool putting about your, it. Just doing something that's fucking hard. You know, mm. I, I just like that. I think that's really cool. Yeah, I don't know. All right, we'll do one more question for today. This one might be a quickie here, Curtis. This one's from uh, Katsuis. The title's email is Secondary Role Reviewing. Hey, I queue mid-jungle, so depending on the patch, I play jungle a lot. Usually, I just pick my main echo and hope to win the ch with Chant Mastery, and it works all right. When we need AD jungle, I go for easy champs like Viego or Nocturne, but I don't feel or perform very well with them. Do you think it's worth reviewing those games, or should I just focus on my main role? He's, D he's Diamond 2 for context. I have, we might have different philosophies. Mm. I have my personal philosophy when it comes to reviewing. So there's kind of two things. I think that at, at everyone's, in everyone's journey, at some stage, doesn't have to be now, just at some stage, I do think it's worthwhile to, to set aside a period of time where you focus on your secondary role. I do believe that. Mm. I've done that with support. I've like really focused on it. And, and, and I did put my main journey aside. I've done that before. And I recommend that for everyone. If you're actually going to pick a secondary role and you want to have success long term, you got to like do that month of just grinding that, like really taking it seriously, whether it's getting coaching in that role, whether it's like making that your main role or whatever the hell it is that you need to do. I think at some stage you've got to do that or I think it's a worthy investment of time. That's my personal take. Another way of going about it is um, you just don't review it at all. You're playing it so little, like let's say one in every six games or something. And it's like, all right, I'm just going to play it bare minimum, just kind of basic, do my job. And then just really hardcore focus on my main role. And that's also fine. But I will say that that it definitely depends. You know, I wouldn't do one of the harder roles though, if that was the case. If you want to do that, you're better off putting like maybe, you know, 80 carrier support as your secondary role, because then it's probably a little bit easier to just kind of like, do the bare minimum. Um, but as, especially <laughs> as a jungle. You're just shit on those roles, because what are you talking no, about? No, it's easier to get carried, in my opinion. But like, getting carried as a jungler, it's like you're breaking the game, Like I feel like. like 
If you're the jungler and you don't know how to play a role. You think so? I, I don't really think, think so. so. You could just play a farming jungler and then really? you just... Yeah, dude. You can get carried and you can do any map impact for Right. It. I mean, I'm, and this is where I'm here to disagree, personally. Yeah. Maybe I'm biased. I'm a, I'm you're a just biased because you really focus on your jungles. You, you, when, you, when, when a jungler gets gapped on your team that's oh, in the yeah. jungle, that's a huge focus it's for you. Huge dude, focus. every role... Has massive impact, goes. What are you talking about? I'm not about? saying one has one, one impact. Or, or more easier than the other. to get carried. That doesn't make sense. I do think it's way easier to get carried as a as a support AD carry than this as a jungler. Personally, that's my take. I think it's so much easier for me to sit there and play Zig's bot lane than it is for me to play any of champ that I've had competition yeah, with in the jungle. Okay, so I think one hundred percent. If you slot in certain champions, though. Yes. If you play Karthus jungle versus playing Lee Sin jungle, that's a huge difference because with. Same with like, yeah, same I would with like agree. you know how people play but not enchanted e supports. You know, that's your Ziggs. Right. Karthus would be your Ziggs for my, another role. My, you can okay. insert certain champions in roles that allow you to get Okay, carried. so let's get let's get even more specific then. I think my my take is that there is if we take the easiest to execute brain dead junglers mm. and then we take the same thing but for support and AD carry. I feel like it's easier to play the brain dead AD carry in, in support than it is to play that brain dead jungler. In terms of net, how much you're ruining the game. Because, okay, like the amount of times, I, and then I'm biased because I've seen this like in, in, you know, you get like some autofield jungler and yeah, let's say they say, oh, I'm going to full clear on my Shivana jungle <laughs> yeah. or whatever it is. <laughs> they don't do anything. Okay. The jungler inv impacts all the lanes, Ooh. all this stuff, or they, or they invade and kill them on their red buff because they don't know Rengar can in per vertical invade. It's like, well... The game's just fucked. Oh, okay, maybe jungle. You're just looking at it through the perspective, of, of course. Like a Karthus just sit, somehow sits. Karthus is, by the way, not even easy. By the way, yeah, it is. I don't know easy. what you're talking about. Yeah, like no, Karthus right. sitting there. Like the only junglers that, like, I think if you if a mid laner specifically was going to play jungle, it would be something like the, yeah, like an Echo that just sits there and they could they've already got kind of champ mastery on it. Yeah, and so they can kind of skirmish with it already. Okay, because again, I think about top. I, I just, think about if you're secondary there, you don't have to put that much effort. You can play Malphite at top, right? I agree with you that. Even top. AD I just think jungle's you, the worst. Yeah, maybe jungle is. The I worst. personally think jungle's you the worst right. to autofill. Or to secondary role and just do nothing. I yeah. think it's the worst. I think role. AD Because you're, you're ruining the, the game for everyone. Yeah. You know, like, sh there's no way you can make an argument, Nathan, that someone just picking Garen top or like Orn top or Scion top and sitting there and like getting, let's say, even if they get doubled in CS. It's not ruining the game. Yeah, you're right. You're versus right. Okay, like, I agree with Curtis. I agree with you. I think that junglers, if you're secondary jungler, I mean, you're no, not I wouldn't. If that's what you believe. No, now thinking about it, you're right. Yes. You, there can be jungle gap, I guess, is a thing in a way. <laughs> Compared to other roles, because again, like I mean, I mean, if, if you were to play, let's let's say again, secondary role, you don't have to have like a, a you don't even have to have a fifty one percent or fifty percent role. You can you can climb still, and your secondary role is like a forty five. You can lose, yeah, you can lose negative, more than you right? win, and still. So I'm just trying to think, like if you're playing like a full clear AFK farm jungler, you're if you win forty five percent of the time with it. I think it's so. I think it's so dependent on the individual. Think about stats and because like, like there are people games. in my program that have so much success with jungle. Yeah, really. And they barely play it. Like, I got wow. a guy named Zelu, and he he never played jungle before. Picks up Briar jungle, gets like diamond with it. Just just do doesn't know anything about the role. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got that, I got, I've had that with heaps of clients. I just yeah. pick they and they say jungle's like the easiest role or some shit because you know why they view it through their lens because they've already got great mechanics. They've already great, great right. skirmishing. Yeah. They already have the champ mastery yeah. on that champion. Yeah. So if they know how to fight well and they have the champ mastery, they can make it work. Mm. So like, you know, and they're probably already smart. They know macro and they know all the stuff about the game. So I think, I think it depends on the underlying skill set. Like, look, I see where you're coming from, but like, I think I'm just thinking from the average player, like from for someone who's been in the mid lane Academy who understands the game. Well, they understand win cons role. Like they, they understand the basics of the game pretty well. Like, they could probably jungle and not die and like skirmish well and be pretty impactful. But I'm talking about the average player who doesn't think deeply about the game, you know? So I think it really depends on the person. I think there are some people that would, could sit there, full clear on Echo Jungle and have a lot of success. There are some people that could sit there and full clear on a, on a jungle and just be useless and they they couldn't make it work. So I, I don't know. Well, you still, that's what I'm saying. You still can because you're going to get, even if you have a 45 minute rate, you're going to at least have maybe, you only need like one or two winning lanes and then Nimi Jungler stuffing up a couple of times to just auto win right. those games. So yeah. you can auto win a certain amount of I games just, with the jungle if you have some competence. Oh, look, I, again, I'm, I just want to loop this all back to what I first said. I just personally think that, I just personally think that like you, you should at least go through one stint of learning. the Yeah. Role. Yeah. I yeah. think that's so valuable. All right, cool. 
So going back to the roles about, you know, reviewing your secondary role. Uh, let's just go back what I did. I, I, again, I did the exact thing back in 2019 or whatever. I, I did a support only account. I climbed just like diamond two. Right. Remember that? Yep. And so I did, I put in effort into it, my secondary yeah, you role. Did that. And then that gave you a baseline foundation yeah. to work with. And then you can just like, whatever it Yeah. for a while, you yeah. know? And then usually it catches up to you and then you've got to revisit it because the game changes. But yes. like, you know, every now and then you go to an update. It's like updating the iOS on your iPhone or some shit. But I don't actually review the VODs of my support games at all. Nah, and that, who knows, that could be... I mean, I've, I come, I can't think, I'm, I think I'm currently sitting at 39% with Nautilus. So that's probably really subpar for a secondary role win rate. Again, I think 45% would be good. Um, you know, if I got up to a 40,000 win rate, I could be like 1k LP, you know, that's a pretty big difference. Yeah, I feel like your secondary role holds you back a you lot. Back, so maybe I need to go back and. Th- but again, what I would do is I wouldn't just like play here. I'll invest time. You got to like, invest time. You, I don't think you, you should just. I, I wouldn't review. I wouldn't review it if it's like one in every no, no ten point, games. I feel like, but you would you would want to. You only review if you're actually going to commit correct. time to it's it. It's not worth it. No, it's just not worth it. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. I can. Be, I, I. I actually. I know I'm biased. Cause like I've had, I'm yeah, I, like you said, I'm very sensitive to autofill junglers. So it's just my weakness. I've got, I've got this, some. Uh, there's certain kryptonites out there. Yeah. For me. I've got my. Crypto- <laughs> yeah, you got- I've got my crypt. I I get really, I get really upset actually. Like I know this is a weakness of mine when, when um, when like in draft, like if they don't swap, if like the jungler or eighty carry doesn't swap. Ah, uh, I see. Like I, I get actually upset. Yeah. It like tilts me. Yeah. Um, or like if a jungler picks Nidalee. Yeah. Um, I've got my own kryptonite. Everyone yeah, has their kryptonite. Everyone has their kryptonite. I've got my kryptonite. They've got so many negative experiences of created narratives around that. Yeah, I've got, I've, I've got narratives. Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm working does. on it. I'm working, working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a work in progress, Curtis. <laughs> I've got my narratives, that's for sure. I'll tell you one that's recently popped up with me, Thresh Support. In terms of good or bad? Bad. I, I think Thresh Support yeah. is... I, I, I think I've, I definitely would have a negative memory. As in, as in like... You, on your team yeah on my team they're, it's they're a very hard game on the enemy team it's a free win oh. yeah that's my current <laughs> right average. interesting i think thresh is like the hard, thresh is like the need to live support in my eyes interesting uh, as in like a lot of people think they can play it when yeah, they can't no. yeah yeah i can see that yeah i i'm starting to develop a little bit of a narrative with center i feel like that champ's like just really good like when it's played well i think it's goddamn good i think it can you can be the most useful champ in the game yeah, and it's all Freak the lenses out. we look through, yeah. you know. All right, well, there we go. That was an interesting discussion to end the <laughs> podcast with Curtis. Share us your kryptonite. <laughs> yeah, share with in the comments your kryptonite in League of Legends. That would just turn to a cesspool. Do not do that, Do please. not do that. Yeah, it's negative. <laughs> Good work, guys. Let's keep on improving, and we'll see you next week.